Thanks. I, um, I, I'd, like to talk, I'd like to talk about great surgical trainers. And you, um, those of you who were at the Da Vinci Award um, yesterday, we'll, 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 some of these themes will resonate with that. I think we, we all remember our trainers, good or bad, and the, the, the good ones hopefully become role models for ourselves. But what is it? What is it that makes someone a great trainer? Is it something that they're born with, they're just a natural? Or is it something that they do and it's a behavior which that we can replicate and we can learn? And that's the question which, which, which I'm going to try and address today. Um, the, the traditional model of surgical or indeed medical education, of an apprenticeship, probably no longer applies for a whole variety of reasons. Um, and we've got to think of something, another way of training. And what, we've, what we did in the UK in 2007 was introduce a much more structured, curriculum-based approach to surgical training. Oops. Sorry. With a, a clear objectives, a clear syllabus to define those objectives, teaching and learning, assessment, quality assurance, and, and program management. And we, we brought this out in about 2007 with an electronic learning management system. And we thought, aren't we clever? We thought we was fantastic. Uh, we believed the field of dreams thing, that if we build it, they will come. Uh, but it didn't work that way. And we got an independent evaluation of the curriculum soon after it came out by a, a guy called uh, Michael Arrow, who's a very distinguished medical educationist from the University of Sussex, and he was not very complimentary. And he, he was complimentary about the curriculum, but very uh, not so complimentary about the state of surgical training in the UK. And that's not just cardiothoracic training, that was all surgical training. And he made a number of observations, one of which I think we, he put us on a warning, uh, which if surgical training doesn't improve, there's going to be problems in the future. But he also highlighted the importance of individual trainers and, tr and, and, and training of trainers. And as, um, this was kind of emphasized by the General Medical Council in the UK and their um, trainee survey, do an annual trainee satisfaction survey. And basically, without going into this in too much detail, what it shows, that these red flags here, show that people in, surg in, sur in early years surgical training are actually very unhappy with the experience and the training they're getting. So um, it's, not, it's not good news, despite the investment, both of expertise and money, that went into creating a new curriculum. But of course, training is, is a rather a complex mixture of a whole series of elements. The curriculum, oh, I'm sorry, just being one of them, um, there's the interaction between the trainee and the trainer themselves. And there's also the training environment, some of which can be altered in terms of a training culture within a training unit, and some of which can't be altered. And, and particularly for the UK, the thing that's really uh, had an impact, rightly or wrongly, has been the European Working Time Regulation, which has changed uh, a lot of the training environment. So it's a complex mix, and a new curriculum is not the answer. But what about the trainee? Are trainees different from when I was a trainee, from when some of you other guys were trainees? Well, uh, as a, uh, there is a, this question has been asked, and it is thought by the sociologists that there's a generational shift, if you like, and those of us who are perhaps baby boomers or Generation X, Generation Y, we now have Generation Me. Uh, and trainees in, uh, tend to have, or have been demonstrated to have, certain characteristics which makes them slightly different from those trainees who would su be suited to an apprenticeship type of program. So they are 
more focused on their work-life balance than I was or we were. They're more assertive and, and, and demand more. Uh, they know more of their rights rather than their responsibilities is one way of looking at it. Very self-absorbed, conservative, like things to be the same. They are miserable, apparently. They're very unhappy with their lives. But what they have got, which we haven't got, which I haven't got, is they're very adept with new technologies. They've all want, they want everything on an app. And this has been written up. If you wanted to, uh, to, to take a look at this paper, it really quite, makes quite an interesting read. But I prefer to think of it as, you know, put it in simplistic terms. The trainees are different. So if the trainees are different, trainers have to be different. About 15 years ago, the Royal College of Surgeons introduced a, 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 an entry level training the trainers program, uh, which taught, uh, tr was the aim of which was to teach people how some very basic teaching skills, mainly about presentational skills, but also um, some, some techniques for small group teaching and uh, clinical skills. Very much entry level, usually done by either senior trainees or very, very young consultants. And that was it. There's nothing after that. So that is, as, that is the level of the training, the trainees program, trainers program. And our question then is, can we set higher standards for surgical trainers? Can we improve the quality of surgical training by making our trainers better? The General Medical Council has done a piece of work on this and is trying to move things forward. But I ask the question, what knowledge, skills, attitudes you need to be a great trainer. How are we going to find that out? And this is where we come back to the Leonardo da Vinci Award and its originator, which was the Silver Scalpel Award, created by uh, David O'Regan when he was um, president of the Association of Surgeons in Training in the UK, awarded to the surgical trainer in the UK who, who was uh, regarded as, as the best best surgical trainer. And it was a quite a complex uh, selection process, which David, I'm sure, would be happy to share with you if you've got a couple of hours to spare. Um, but this has now been running for 10 years, so we have had 10 winners of this, and we've had 20 runners-up. So we've got a tranche, if you like, of 30 high-performing surgical trainers. What makes them great? And the question we asked a couple of years ago, is it possible to, to find out what it is that makes a great surgical trainer and whether what they have or do can be passed on to other trainers or whether it's something intrinsic within them and we just have to you know, admit to the fact that there's good trainers and there's bad trainers. So what we did was we took these 30 proven high-quality surgical trainers and we explored a few things with them. We did some personality uh, um, work with them. We got some reflective writing. We put them through a, a workshop with some uh, occupational psychologists. We tried to find out what it was about them that made them great trainers. And it was really quite interesting, because this is the uh, PF16. These are the personalities. And although there are one or two quite interesting things that come out of this, for the majority of the 16 personality things, they were all pretty much down the middle. They had no special personalities. There was nothing special or uh, uh, obviously different about these people, which came as a bit of a shock to us. There are one or two things which we thought, oh, that's, you know, that figures, we can we work that out. But you can see that most of them are in the, are in the middle of the graph. So characteristics, personalities, not a big difference. There were some things, which, some threads which we found, and you wouldn't, be, you wouldn't be surprised to see those. But what we did find was that their behaviors were all the same. They did things similarly. And this is a list of what we found was 
very character was very characteristic, very common across a whole range of great surgical treatments. They did all these things, no matter what sort of personality or person they were. And that was quite encouraging because you can teach people behaviours whereas you can't teach them personalities. So we, we identified these uh, common behaviours and these are the conclusions we, we, we came to. That, uh, just to recap, all trainers had differing personality traits but they weren't remarkable. Their behaviours, however, were remarkably similar and we felt that many of these behaviours can be learnt, practised and reinforced by anyone who, who shows the, uh, the, the, the willingness to do that. And this really is, if we took our thread, if you like, from Stephen Covey, who's one of his uh, management gurus, and you'll see his books in the airport uh, all the time, but he defined the seven habits of highly effective people. It's what they do, not what they are. And of course, Stephen Covey made a, made a lot of money out of this, so of course we were immediately interested by developing the, the, the theme further. So we set up um, early this year through the Society for Cardiothoracic Surgeon, Surgery in the UK with a very generous educational grant support, a leader's educator program with a stated outcome of having one really high quality educational guru in each surgical training unit in the UK. That's what we, we're working towards. So we had a series of, of educational objectives which are about teaching behaviours, not about changing people's personalities. And you can see those are the sort of things we, we try to do. And we've created a programme, not a, not a course. So we had pre-meeting meetings where we uh, tried to see what they, we, what they understood, what they wanted to get out of it, and we gave them some homework to do before we had our residential. We asked them to leave before they left the residential they had to come up with an action plan and tell us how they were going to go back to their units and improve the training in their unit. We provided them with both real and virtual uh, support and mentorship. And they've already, this group has already formed a buddy system. They're in communication with each other all the time. And recently we've just done a six month review to see how what progress is being made. So just to give you a flavour of many of the elements of this course, this is one element was just about how do you lead people's learnings. Well, one of the things we did was we got, people, we got our uh, pioneers group to understand learning styles. Everyone has got a different learning style. You have to adapt your teaching to your trainee's learning style. Are they activists, reflector, theorists or pragmatists? And you can do that using this readily available tool. Once you do that, you can then uh, examine uh, their learning cycles and how, where you have to focus on which bit of their, 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 the learning cycle according to their learning style. You create a, mo a learning a model or leading their learning model of which is circular and is about consolidation, uh, uh, training, and, and you, you, you defining objectives and you alter your own training behavior according to whether you need to be supportive or directive. So you're either delegating, coaching, di uh, directing or training. And that was just one element. And we had elements on giving feedback, we had elements on uh, reflective practice and elements on, on coaching. So there's quite a lot went into that three-day program. We got a um, an educationalist to evaluate it as we were running it and any evaluation of any educational uh, event, um, like everything in medical education, I've said this before, but everything in medical education is either a circle or a pyramid. This is a pyramid and uh, the pyramid, the top of the pyramid is patient care. We got participation and I think we got from the feedback we got a lot of satisfaction and we have been able to demonstrate from the participants in the program that they have learned something. We've seen them learn something and we've also seen them change their practice which is really reassuring. What we haven't seen yet and something we, we, we need to look out for is whether that impacts on the care that is eventually being delivered to, to, our, to, to patients. 
but the feedback has been generally very positive um, and uh, hopefully we can now start to develop this program further and start some networking opportunities. Um, one, of the, one of the real uh, things uh, that worries me about this thing is that people will have this fantastic experience and six months later something more important will happen in their lives and it'll all be forgotten. And we've got to maintain the momentum. I described it as like, it's a bit like peeing yourself in a wetsuit. It gives you a nice warm feeling, but usually nobody notices. So we've got plans to move this forward, um, so, and uh, I'll can we'll talk about that perhaps possibly later on. But in summary, um, I think it's important that, to take away the message that high-performing trainers can be developed if they are given the right opportunity. You don't have to wait for people to come out of the ether and be a good trainer. You can make them. But in order to do that, you need to develop networks, you need to maintain the momentum, you need to keep the pressure on which is what we're trying to do. And we are trying, uh, considering a review, slight, some tinkering at the edges, running the course possibly again next year with a view to wider implementation, if it, if it does work uh, at a later date. And as I said before, the impact on patient care needs to be evaluated. John, Sir John Temple was asked by um, Medical Education England to do a review of the impact of the European Working Time Directive on medical education, which he did, which he did last year. And he made this statement. And I don't, I don't think anyone would disagree with the fact that if we don't get our training right, we've got, we're going to have problems with patient safety. And I'll leave you with that and I'll take any questions.